Greetings ENF family and those of you joining us by YouTube. So glad you can be with us as we join together and celebrate the goodness of God. We are celebrating Resurrection Sunday. This is the day that the Lord made that broke every yoke of bondage from believers and we now live in victory because in that he lives, we live also. Praise his name. All right, I want to, uh, to do a few announcements real quick and then let's get into uh, this morning's uh, message. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for your continued giving to the church. Your giving has been amazing and phenomenal. Thank you for your faithfulness. And uh, I just want to encourage you in the Lord. And as your pastor say, thank you from the bottom of our heart. It enables us to continue ministering and meeting needs and supporting our missionaries abroad. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Then the next thing I want you to remember is um, to continue to reach out to people. Uh, the church directory that went out this week is available for you to get probably in your email. If you don't have a copy, please notify me. We'll send one to you. That way you can stay in touch with those that you're unable to see when you normally see them here. You're still able to stay in touch. Thank you for the cards that we have received. Thank you for the letters of encouragement that we have received. But I want you to spread that across all of the body. That will be awesome. All right, and then one more thing is, when we finish this morning, the message, we're going to take communion together. So you might go ahead and get your elements prepared and ready, and let's begin this time. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being together through this method of communication. I thank you, Lord, that we can take this time to push pause on life. And we can just celebrate, celebrate, celebrate the goodness of you, Almighty God. We thank you, Jesus, for the plan of salvation. And we praise your name, for you are our Redeemer and our Deliverer. And you are our victory and peace, hope and joy. We bless you, Almighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. This morning, I want to share with you, the title of my sermon is The Day Death Died, but I want to share with you the methods that I got to when I came into this realization about how powerful Resurrection Sunday is. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, it sent shockwaves through all of darkness and the power of Jesus broke forth in eternal strength and authority to give it also us that uh, victory and authority that carries us through life as we experience it right now and will experience it in eternity. So I want to uh, talk to you about how death died and why death dying is our victory. This is Resurrection Sunday, as I said, and in de declaring that, we want to look at the following things. Death has been defeated. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, John says, When I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he, Jesus, laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Then the statement is, and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is total victory because he destroyed that which had held mankind in bondage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57, it talks there about how the more imperishable shall put on, uh, the perishable shall put on imperishable, and the mortal 
puts on immortality. Then it says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory, victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's some things I want to share with you about this. Number one, death was the enemy that resulted in the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. You can see that pointed out in Genesis chapter 3. It states uh, as a further explanation of that in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 in the NIV. It says, for if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more? will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Death is disobedience to God is basically what was concluded from that. In Adam and Eve, when they chose by the deception of Satan to go their own way and to become like God, that brought about death. And that death is disobedience. We find out that it really matters to God. In Exodus chapter 20, verses three through five, which is what we know as the location for the 10 commandments given to Moses, it states in the first these three verses, the first commands that come forth are to remember God and not to allow any other graven images. Don't let anything exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So what we see is that the, the act of disobedience or the act of making something else Lord is what brings about death within our life. It came to us through Adam and it is broken by Jesus. The difference between Christianity and other world religions is no other religion claims death, burial, and resurrection of its leader, teacher, and or deliverer. We find that Jesus not only died and broke the yokes of bondage and broke the power of sin, but in being buried, he buried that sin and then the blood of Jesus that was shed for us became atonement for sin. And then when he raised from the dead through the power of God the Father, he became victor over death, hell, and the grave. In Matthew 16, 21, it says uh, as a further statement to why he proclaimed that he would be raised from the dead, giving authority to his ministry, saying, not only will I die, but I will come back to life. That is declaring breaking the brokenness, the destruction, the snapping of chains of the bondage of death and sin and hell and the grave. It says in Matthew 16, 21, as I started, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He was telling them all through the ministry. Then in Luke 24, verses 5 through 7, it says, of the, the angel said this, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. He has risen. Remember how he told you while you were still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Another declaration that came out after, on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood and he testified, he said, this man's destiny was prearranged for God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet, get this, it was all part of his predetermined plan. 
God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for the death's power to hold Jesus prisoner. Our Lord's resurrection declares by his coming back from the dead that he broke the yokes of bondage and that he lives forevermore. The difference in many instances is that there have been people that have been recorded that died and came back to life. But the difference is they died again. Every one of them died again. But when Jesus died, God the Father raised him again in authority and power. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, never to die again. And that's the life that we receive. We receive eternal life. Death was destroyed and life began. Here's a statement that is in Acts chapter 7 verses 55 through 56. This is when Stephen was being stoned. This gives authority to the fact that not only did he uh, come back from the dead and many saw him, but then Stephen says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Romans 8.34 says, Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Here's the whole point. All of this gives us hope that in this new life that Jesus gave us, this resurrection power in that life, we can live in this same kind of victory and overcome. The greatness of God was exercised in power in this statement. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, it says that he, God, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. In other words, when he came back to life, he became the authority for all of eternity, not just for a single event. It says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are of above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You'll find that in Colossians 3.1. The book of Revelation tells us that he is alive, large, and in charge. Read it. You'll see in the book of Revelation that he says that he is the first and the last. He is the living one. He was dead. And now look, he is alive. Oh man, this is exciting because he is alive and alive forevermore. Coming back to life has happened before. But Jesus never died after the death on the cross. He is alive from resurrection Sunday on, seated at the right hand of the Father, bringing us delivering power to give us victory over death, hell, and the grave. We live in a powerful place of authority. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 through 28, it says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So not only do we live in this victory now, but there is coming a day when all of darkness and all the works of darkness will be placed in bondage and bound for time and eternity. And you and I will be given this life that is so abundant and so 
so amazing and that we can be with Christ forever. Well, some things that are important, I think, about death's control being broken is that there has to be in the one who comes to break it certain qualifications that must be met. Number one, a Savior has to come. And we find that in Luke chapter 1. We find that Jesus came, that he dwelt among us, that he was born of a virgin, and that he was declared the king by the angels in that very first chapter. Another thing is a Savior must qualify. He must be given the authority. He must be placed in a position of authority. And we find that in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, when Jesus was being buried, buried in water, when he was being baptized in water, when he was in that moment with John the Baptist, and when he came out of the water, the Father spoke from heaven. The, 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 the Spirit of the Lord came down in the symbol of a dove. And in that, it was the declaration that Jesus was large and in charge and ready for authority to be breaking forth in the lives of people here on earth at that time and then on to the culmination of the cross, death, burial, and resurrection. So he qualified. A savior must prove that he is savior. John chapter 14, verses six through seven, it says, I am the way, this was Jesus. I am the truth and I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is interesting, only through him no one else so a next point is a savior must die in john chapter 19 verses 28 through 30 it says jesus knew that his mission was now finished he's hanging on the cross and to fulfill scripture he said i'm thirsty a jar of sour wine was sitting there so they soaked a sponge in it put it on a hyssop branch and held it to his lips when he had tasted it he said it is finished. In other words, he said, everything is fulfilled. And his obedience <laughs> broke disobedience. And we have life. So the first thing I want you to say with me is, Jesus hung on a cross. Say it with me. Jesus hung on a cross. The next thing is, he died. A savior must die. In John 19, verses 33 through 35, it says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it bore witness. His testimony is true. This is John. And he knows that he's telling the truth for a single purpose, that you and I might believe. A savior must defeat the present ruler. In 1 Peter 2.24, we quote this a lot for healing, but there is more to it than just healing. It is the fullness of our gift of salvation. It says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed it says those of you that were dead in your sins and trespasses god made you alive together with him colossians 2 verses 13 through 15 having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its demands its legal demands then he set aside this is what he set aside our legal demands placed against us of sin and guilt. Those were nailed to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Wow, that's amazing. So here we see, and say it with me, he canceled the debt. He canceled our debt. 
He canceled our debt of sin. And he always lives. Now, it also says that he was always in control. So he wasn't a victim. He was in control. In John 10, verses 17 through 18, it says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. That's where his authority came was from the Father. Then I love this next portion of Scripture I want to share with you when we find out that he defeated the present ruler. That means that 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 states it very clearly. It says, But we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God declared or decreed before the ages for our glory. This is what we glory in. He saved us. Now it says, None of the rulers of this age understood this. But if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have done it. So, I love this. It means that they did not know they were playing into a divine plan. The rulers and the authorities and the powers of darkness did not realize what they were doing. But they played right into the hands, so to speak. There, this was a magnificent plan because when Jesus declared, it is finished. Sin was broken. And then when Christ came back from the dead, life eternal broke forth through the life of obedience through Jesus. And we share in that. And that sends tremors through the works of darkness. It says, For he was made sin for us, that, and he knew no sin, so that in him, the one who had no sin, we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. It also says that when Jesus went to the cross in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, for the joy that was set before him. It was a joy for him. He looked forward to the power of sin being broken. And for that joy that was set before him, he endured the cross for you and I. So now it comes to the point. We get to celebrate. Today is the opportunity to celebrate. And on Sunday, that day that is called Resurrection Sunday, is the highest opportunity to celebrate. Why do we celebrate? Well, listen to this. John chapter 14, verse 19 says, Because I live, you also live. In Romans 8, verses 37 through 39, it says, In all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. Why? For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything in all of creation, of which Satan is created, in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is awesome. This is amazing. We are are forever 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 children of the king we are forgiven and that sin that was so easily set against us in guilt and shame is now broken we get to say with the others that have declared this down through the ages that he is alive and because he lives, we live. So let's think about this. He's alive. When was it first declared? It was declared by Mary and then the disciples and then the angels at the tomb. And then God the Father declared it when he raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit declared it starting with the day of Pentecost and is still declaring it to this day. And we can declare it also. You know how I know that we can? 
It's like the old song that says, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So we can declare that he is Savior and Lord. It says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord to the glory of the Father. He is alive forevermore. Death died. Christ is alive. And we live in authority and power. In John chapter 5 verse 24 it says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have, but they have already passed from death to life. When you make him Savior and Lord, you have passed from death to to life. Romans 10 13 says for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is good news and you and I we can share in it. There's no secret surrenders that come but wholehearted surrenders come and if you would like to make Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord Now's the time and the opportunity for you to declare it. If you would like to make him Savior and Lord, pray with me in this prayer, and you will know him as your Savior. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We give you praise for you alone are worthy to receive all our praise. We recognize that in ourselves we have sin, and that sin has been what held us back. But in Jesus Christ, that sin is broken and we are no longer victims of a kingdom of darkness, but we are in the kingdom of eternal light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Forgive us our sins, we pray. Take our lives, use them, for Lord, we know we need you. And I confess you now as Savior and Lord. You prayed that prayer? Welcome to the kingdom. Let's take communion together. The scripture tells us that on that night before Jesus was to enter into that time of uh, the procedure and the process of dying, being hung on a cross, that night before he took the bread and he took the cup and he gave it to us to do in remembrance of him. The body is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is our opportunity to participate and just believe in his obedience. As we take of this bread, let us thank him for his life of obedience and the freedom that he brought to us. This do in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord, for a life of obedience. Thank you for a body that was broken for us. Thank you, Lord, that your body hung on a cross and that it, it was the element of sacrifice by which we gain life eternal. We thank you, Lord. And from that body came blood. And this cup is to represent the body of our Lord. And it says, and as oft as we do this, we are to remember the Lord until he comes. We have redemption. The body of Christ and the blood. The scripture tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But with the shedding of blood, there is. Let us drink in remembrance of the power of the blood Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you died for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you were buried. And on that third day, just according to what you said, you came forth in life. You broke the bondage 
of death, hell, and the grave, and you established a life of eternal kingdom living. And we celebrate that today. He is alive and alive forevermore. Let your praises be known this week. Share Jesus with others. God bless you.